All righty, welcome. I am Susan Kanega. I am the program manager for data governance and Rhett Nelson was um, unable to facilitate the webinar today as he usually does in this series. So um, I'm helping in and my focus is data quality in the agency and so I do work closely with with Lisa Ireland, who is our data analyst and student information, as we work together on um, providing the best information that that we uh, that we can, and so Lisa is going to be leading the presentation today. And um, with no further ado, I will continue um, with the next slide here. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, Rent and I have been chatting lately about the different types of dropouts, helping folks identify how to report them and maybe some tips and tricks on reviewing what information you might have in your student information system, how it gets to CEDARS, and helping maybe your leadership understand the differences and provide support to the staff to um, look further into this and to provide you support and empower your people. So we're going to Work through the top four things, understanding the types or categories of dropouts, looking at dropout data, reporting your dropouts, and improving your data quality. I'm no longer hearing this talk. Okay, first of all, we have three types or categories of dropouts. The first one is a dropout. There's a known reason for why the student dropped out. Uh, maybe they attended four years, didn't graduate, chose to pursue other options. Uh, they had a baby and they're staying home to take care of. There's a wide variety of re known reasons for student dropping out. Then you have students that exit school and go and obtain a GED. Unfortunately, even though that's an accomplishment, they're still considered dropouts under federal law. And then we have the unknown dropouts. This is the big category that we're really going to focus on today. Unknown dropouts are students who quit while attending school with no provided reasons. They may report they're moving out of public school in Washington, but no transfer or records request is received, or summer dropouts. Student is actively enrolled at the end of the year. Say, have a nice summer. We'll see you in the fall. And they never show up. So folks, we get a lot of questions about why do we care? Is there a big difference between the dropouts and unknowns? Well, as we discovered, dropouts reported for a student you know who dropped out or exited. Unknown, we don't know. They just disappear. You make effort to contact them. The families move. There's no phone numbers. And these are the frustrating ones because the odds are we don't hear from these kids when they go too long. If you're curious about what the different dropout codes are, CEDARS Appendix M in the CEDARS uh, Data Manual section on OSPI contains a list of all school withdrawal codes and their definitions. And there's a link at the bottom of slide number six that contains that. Or if you go to the OSPI website and do a search for CEDARS manuals, it'll take you to that page. And so Lisa, let's, let's just pop out there and we will... Uh, just make sure everybody probably knows how to how to get there, but we'll we'll go there. Where is my? There it is. This is my second pair of eyes here. <laughs> All right. So um, what Lisa was talking about. The easy path is if you're on the main website, you drop you go to research reports. You drop down to comprehensive education data research system or CEDARS. Then on the left hand side there's a gray menu bar. You click on data manuals and appendices and down below the data manual, and I want to point at the screen, and talk about <laughs> the data, there's download the appendices or you should be able to click on Appendix M. And I have to tell you sometimes that link works, sometimes you have to go to the main one and then link internally. So we have them listed, what the decodes are and what their explanation is, and also the unknown codes, which are towards the bottom of the appendices, and code C1, which says the student, you had confirmed receipt of general EED. 
or general education development. So the student has brought you proof of the GED completion or the local community or technical college has let you know the student obtained that. Thanks, Susan. So who should not be reported as dropouts? I'm, I'm surprised. Um, we get lots and lots of questions about this every year. Students who are enrolled in your school who should not be reported with the school redraw code of dropout unknown, whatever. Foreign exchange students who attend your school and exit and go back to their what we call their country of origin at the end of the year. Homeschool or private school students who enroll part-time or possibly to attend um, running start full-time. And students who enroll but never receive educational services. And I get questions all the time. How do we report these students? Foreign exchange students, at the end of the school year, you simply provide a school and district withdrawal code with a transfer out of state. Home and private school students, at the end of this, every school year, you should report a school and district withdrawal code and a T2 transfer back to home or private school. And students who enroll but never receive educational services, the main group of students we hear about that this occurs with is the early enrollment in the summer. The family's going to move to the area, they're coming out of private school, they come in and enroll, but they never receive educational services in your district. If you have accidentally reported them to CEDARS, you may remove them from your next submission and they'll be logically deleted. Same with if they start in the middle of January or February, that doesn't matter. And any of these students, the foreign exchange, homeschool, or private school students, whether it's the very end of the school year or they simply quit attending in the middle of the school year, they should always be reported as a confirmed transfer out of your district. So Lisa, we've had a question come in. We have two special ed students who registered in our district. The parents had a meeting with our school psych and it was determined we could not accommodate these students. Can I delete them from the high school since they never set foot in the door, or do I need to count them as dropouts? They did not register anywhere else. If you never provided educational services, we used to say educational seat time, but since we now have online schools, ALE schools, and a variety of learning opportunities, if you never provided educational services to them, you may, you may remove them from your submission and they will be logically deleted. You should not be accountable for those kids. All righty. Um, and so we're going to proceed to questions about the, uh, the data. So if you have any more questions about what has been submitted so far, feel free to, to ask. We'll take a pause here. And let's see. Um, so one person is having a problem with the audio cutting out. Um, can we get a list of what codes to use for students we do not list as dropouts? Does that make sense to you, Lisa, that question? If, Gloria, can you please provide a, um, some additional clarification on what your question is? If, are you talking about students that quit attending and you don't know where they are? Oh, for the foreign exchange student, okay. So the codes to use for students who don't list as dropouts, I see for the foreign exchange, home or private school, right, you would confirm transfer them. The fourth bullet, students who enroll but never receive educational services, you can remove them from your CEDARS submissions and they'll be logically deleted the next time you submit your data to CEDARS. So we have a question on gravity students. How does that look like in a withdrawal? Well, there's multiple scenarios on how students attend gravity. If you are a home district, uh, since we are housed here in Olympia, we'll say the Olympia School District has a student who's a resident or their home district is Olympia and the student attends a re-engagement school at gravity. Olympia would report the student as primary, no. Some basic information, school and district enrollment, race and ethnicity, and the code that tells us that the student is attending gravity. Gravity will report all of the additional information for that student. 
at such time the student may, we'll use Susan as an example, Susan has been attending Gravity, she sleeps in the Olympia School District boundaries at night, so she's a resident of Olympia, we're getting information from Olympia as primary no, the Gravity School under ESD 113 is reporting her as primary yes, if she drops out of Gravity or just quits attending, becomes an unknown or negative status, Gravity would report that exit, they would let Olympia know, and Olympia would close out her school and district enrollment and report her as a confirmed transfer out. Thank you, Lisa. Here's another question. When a middle school student is forecasted for high school but never set foot in the high school, should they be given a U code? Yes. If a student, regardless if a student is changing school levels, meaning from elementary to middle school, middle school or junior high to high school, or they're changing grades from 11th to 12th grade, that's what we would call a summer no-show, which would be a U2 withdrawal code enrolled in prior year, but no-show this year. And a lot of these questions about what code to use and how to code them, we do have fairly extensive information in the CEDARS guidance, so if we don't ask answer your question today or later on you have additional thoughts about this, you can look at the CEDARS guidance or of course contact one of us. So to find a confirmed request for transfer, confirmed request for transfer is just that. You've received a records request from the school or district the students enrolled in, whether it's a school in another state, whether it's a private school, or if you have a parent come in and indicate Lisa's going to become a homeschool student and they fill out and sign and you have on file a current intent to homeschool form. The parent indicating they're moving and we're going to put Lisa in school in Denver, Colorado is not a confirmed request. Uh, having a student say, we're moving, you actually have to have confirmation that the student is enrolled and attending elsewhere. Now again in the guidance, in the CEDARS guidance, we have We've updated the information about what is a confirmed transfer, so that should be very helpful to you when you're, when, if you have additional questions after reading that section, please let me know. Okay. What is the withdrawal code for students who enroll but never receive educational services? You would not report a withdrawal code to CEDARS. Your student information system may have to handle that differently, and I would ask that you check with your vendor. But for a student who enrolls but never comes to school, you would simply remove them or delete them from your CEDAR submissions. And the gravity questions, let's jump back there later because what I'd like to do is let's go through the PowerPoint a little bit further. We may answer some of your questions and then we'll jump back and do our best. I think we'll have time to address almost all of your questions. All right, here's another one. We have a student, 18 years old, came from El Salvador, no high school, so entered as a ninth grader. He showed up for two weeks and then left without notice, 20-day non-attendance. If you provided educational services to that student, unfortunately you will have to report the student as a dropout, regardless of where they enroll from. If they've uh, participated in education in your district, you have to be accountable for them. If the student enrolled and then never showed for those 20 days and then you finally figured out, well, I guess he's not coming to school, that would be the same as never receiving educational services. But if you have provided services or, edu or excuse me, education to the student, then we do. So let's move on a little bit and then we can jump back through some of those questions. We have some great questions coming. We might hit one or two more here and then we'll try and get to the rest of your questions. Hopefully we'll answer some of them. So if we go to the next slide, another one of the big questions is dropout data. Yeah, we know they're gone. Does it matter really if it's a D or a U? Who's really looking at it? We focus on our grad rates. Well, the dropout information is looked at uh, by the annual OSPL legislative report and appendices we publish. We have to submit dropout data to federal and state reporting. We have extensive federal and state reporting that this information is included on. We have research requests where we send out de-identified student level data and it's consumed by the Education Research Data Center here in Washington State. It's used by the CTE office for their federal Perkins reporting data. Your school boards and superintendents look at that. 
The press, as we know, has a heyday with our data. Special interest groups, families that are moving, the list goes on and on. We don't realize how much of this graduation and dropout data is looked at, and the dropout data, for some reason, gets a lot more focus. So we're just going to run through some quick facts about dropouts in Washington. This may or may not surprise some of you. Looking at the four-year cohort class of 2014, now I know for those of you out there that work with your graduation dropout data, I know we just completed the 14-15 review. We've not published the data yet, so we're looking at what's been made public. For the four-year cohort class of 2014, it'll be the kids that started uh, ninth grade in the 10-11 school year, follow them through the end of 2014. Of the 9,670 students identified as dropping out that we were not able to locate anywhere else in Washington, 56.9% of those dropouts are unknowns. And the unconfirmed transfers makes up a pretty, pretty good sized group of that and the unknown students. Smallest group is the summer uh, no-shows. So if you look at that, it's, it's pretty startling on our pie chart there. It is. So then if we look at, and just to break this out, the five-year cohort, so we are displaying the four-year cohort information again. We're providing the five-year cohort class of 2013 that would have been published in the 2014 school year. 55.5% are unknown dropouts. Now, a lot of folks get confused, why would that number change? Well, remember that's two different groups of kids. And also, we find, especially with the re-engagement programs and whatnot, we're, we're bringing more kids back on board in that fifth year, which is good. That's still a very high number of our dropouts to be unknown. We have no idea where these kids are or what's going on with them. And then just a real quick annual dropout, if we looked at the 13-14 school year, the annual dropouts would be of those students reported to CEDARS in the 13-14 school year identified as being in grades 9 through 12, regardless of when their graduation requirements here or expected grad year, 61.6% of the dropouts you told us about are unknown dropouts of the 14,313 students. That's a really high number. Hmm. Okay, and thank you for pointing. So grade 7 and 8 reported an additional 2,795 students as unknown or dropout. We're seeing more and more dropouts in the lower grades. Hmm. It's not a good thing. So if folks who are listening today are not part of the graduation dropout adjusted cohort review every year, you're like, so how do I go get this list? Who do I, how do I find out who CEDARS has listed as a dropout? The best report to look at in the CEDARS reporting system, which is accessed in EDS, which is the Education Data System private link or secure link through our website, it's called the P210 Withdrawal Status Report. And once you access CEDARS, you would click on the Reports link, then the sub-tab of Enrollment, and then the P210 Withdrawal Preview Report. What this does is would list for you by the school year selected the latest or last reported enrollment status for the students submitted by your district. You can look at this at the district level or by individual schools. You can look at current school year 2015-16 back to 2009-10 when CEDARS started. And you have the option, there's some radio buttons you can select to pick particular grade levels, or you can select all grade levels in the school or district, and by withdrawal code or withdrawal code band. In completers, which is our graduates, you know, the kids that graduate with a diploma, AAs, etc. The negative status, which is our dropouts or unknowns or our GED completers, or those students identified as transfers or deceased. One of the tools in this report that a lot of folks don't know is there, if the student was reported as exiting a negative status in your school district, for instance, Susan, who's going to be my example again, was reported in, we'll say, the Yelm School District as an unknown dropout. Last May, she just quit coming to school, and at the start of 15-16 school year, Spokane enrolled her, but Yelm hasn't found out about that yet. If they went and ran their report, 
there would be information in this report that the district Susan enrolled in after Yelm was Spokane and would identify the date she enrolled. Okay. Students from previous years included in the adjusted cohort results. So the five-year adjusted cohort results are used to determine the high school other indicator for adequate yearly progress for AYP. So the annual adjusted cohort graduation report includes is dropouts. Students identified as a member of the cohort in review. So as an example, using the 13-14 school year because we're talking about that data, students who were identified as first starting as grade 9 anywhere in the 9-10 school year identified with the graduation requirements year of 2013 and then we follow them that fifth year to 2013-14 are included in the adjusted cohort for your school district. If your district is the last entity re that reported serving that student in Washington State at any point in time during those five years, those dropouts are included in your report. But that means if the student dropped out in the 11-12 school year and never enrolled anywhere else in Washington or their record did not get cleaned up to a confirmed transfer in Cedars, you will have that student included as a dropout. So you can also go into the Adjusted Cohort Graduation Application, access through EDS. We have details at the bottom of the slide on how to find that. You can go in and look at the list of students and it will tell you in what year they dropped out. Sometimes folks are real surprised that these kids they haven't thought about for two, three, four years are still floating in there and affecting their results. So Lisa, we've had a question to explain the difference between the decode and the U code and how it affects the dropout rate. So that's a great question. D's and U's are both dropouts. They're both negative. But what we're looking at and what we find when we work with districts and they work with their school enrollment staff those unknowns, and again, we talk about a lot of them the unknown from transfers. Sometimes there's a disparity between what's contained in your student information system and what Cedars has. The dropouts, you know, you might see the kid working across the street at McDonald's who decided to drop out in 11th grade. They might be working for the family business. You know, you see them around town with their baby. We know where they are. You can re-engage with them. You try and get them back. The unknown dropouts or the unconfirmed transfers are the ones once folks put into place, I guess, tips and tricks, uh, district policies and efforts that we see the biggest cleanup of data. So really they both count against you, but putting effort into finding those unknown kids, because we know you're probably working with those kids that you know are dropouts and you know where they are. It's the unknown ones that we want to a little more attention to because they're obviously affecting the data the most. So Lisa, if I were to, to recap that, so both these and use affect the dropout rate in the same way. Um, the, the ID code reflects that some effort was put in to determine why. Or the kid told you. Or the kid told you. Right, or like a D1 ex expelled or suspended. You, the students expelled for the rest of the school year. That's a dropout. They don't have a choice, but we know where they are and what's going on. Yep. Unknown, they disappear like smoke and mirrors, or they tell you, hey, we're out of here. We're moving to Florida. <laughs> we never hear anything. All righty. So we will go to the next slide here. So we talked about utilizing the P210 withdrawal status report to compare against the students in negative status reported in your SIS system. Again, when we go out and do trainings and we chat with districts, we recommend that they use this P210 withdrawal status report. And we had a question, how many years should you go back? I'd look at all the years in Cedars if, if you can, start with the most current years or possibly download your data and look at the years with the highest number and decide where you want to start your focus. What a lot of people tell me is, wait a minute, Lisa's not a dropout. We got a records request for her a year ago because we know she's going to school in Boise, Idaho. 
And that might very well be the information. There was due diligence done in updating the records in your student information system, but CEDARS never got that updated story about that student. So that's why we suggest, as a starting point, you use the tool within CEDARS, that withdrawal status report, print a list out of those. Again, you can go by school, you can do grade level, however you want to slice and dice the data, or download the whole Excel file and, and use your filters to start looking at those Look in your student information system to see if there's a disparity, to see who you need to get cleaned up in CEDARS, So we'll talk in a little bit about how to do that. And you might send this information out to your registrars and everybody and say, hey, do you have any better information about the kid? And again, we'll talk about this a little bit about tips and tricks and empowering some of your staff because they might have you know, sent records requests and stuff for quite a few students and not known that if it occurred you know, from when a kid left a couple of years ago, that they should enter it or tell anybody about this. So we're going to talk about the tips and tricks for cleaner data. Cleaner data. We just, you know, mentioned empower and train your frontline staff in schools. What I mean by that is your registrars, the individuals in your school who is assigned the task of enrolling the students, keeping track of them, and when they move. When they get records requests, managing all these records. We've been in these schools. We know how busy these people are. We also know how much they care about their students. So training them to when you get a records request for a student, you need to document who the records went to, who they spoke with, where the records went to. And when they get that, even if it's for a kid that left two or three years ago, who do they send that information on to? They might be documenting all that information in Becky's records or Jose's records or whatever your little student is, but they don't know that they should send it up to the district staff or whoever in your district is assigned to updating the information and pushing it out past their desk or past your school district. You know, develop and provide clear guidelines. If you're the person in your district responsible for this or you work with the person in your district who's responsible for that, who's notified a transfer request for previous years? We talked about who's responsible for updating the data. What to send and not send with students moving out of state. Here's a big one. We hear from districts, well, when the kids leave, because I'll ask the question when we go out, what do you send with the student when the student or parent or guardian says, well, we're taking Susan and we're moving to North Dakota. You know, Susan's a great kid and we want to make sure she does well. So they're like, well, here's her latest report card. Here's her current schedule. Here's a photocopy of her, her immunization, et cetera, et cetera, because they're being good. They want Susan just to keep going and doing well. If you send that information, North Dakota has no reason to ever contact you because they have everything they need to enroll and serve that student. So what we recommend is sending the bare minimum you need to or sending information that says, well, sorry to see you move, Susan, but when you get to North Dakota, here's the contact information for the school or district. Have your new school or district contact us, and we'll be happy to send all your records immediately. So, Lisa, here's a question. Uh, if a student moves out of the country to Mexico, do we still need a records request to list them as confirmed transfer? That's a really good question. So. It, as you indicate, you're probably not going to get a records request from Mexico or if the family moves back to Russia or wherever they, you know, what we would call their country of origin. Your district should have a policy in place that says when you're notified, if the family comes in and says we're moving back to Toluca, Mexico, should have some form that the parent or guardian notifying you of the move is occurring and something asking for contact information or something that would validate the students moving. Their neighbor or best friend or somebody saying, Lisa moved to El Salvador is not a confirmed request. So I know the state auditors, and this is a heads up for everybody, the state auditors have been going around and really nailing people for reporting confirmed transfers when they don't have the confirmation in file. So again, this loops back to you get a phone call from New York that I've enrolled in New York. You want to train your staff. You write down who they spoke to, who they mailed the information to, the date. Or again, if the family comes in and says, you know, our work project has ended, we're moving back to Canada, you ask them for an address to mail the final report card. 
you ask them you know, for some contact information or just have them contact you when they get there to give you their address. Have some type of information. If you have that and it meets what your district determines as acceptable information, that would be a confirmed transfer out of country. That's the real hard one. But again, if it's a, a military family and you hear they transferred to Germany, the local military liaison or family contact center should probably be able to confirm that. It's the families that individually move due to work or other situations that's hard to track. So Lisa, what about the case for a student in a facility like juvenile or a mental hospital that plans to return after a week or so? Do they do a withdrawal or what code would they use? That's a great question. So let me loop back real quick. In CEDARS, there's also a tool called Student Record Exchange. And I realize we did not put this in the PowerPoint. For students that become enrolled in a juvenile justice school, in a juvenile detention center, and you find that information either using the student record exchange, which allows you to look up students or transfer information, you identify the student as enrolled in a juvenile justice school that way, or you receive records requests from them. The school has two options. You can either choose to change the student status to primary no and keep the student enrolled until they return, and if they don't return, you would then report them as a confirmed transfer out of your school on the date you determined they became enrolled in the juvenile justice school. Because if you're, they told you they're in the juvenile justice school, that's a public school. The students enrolled are receiving other services. The mental, host, the mental health facility, it would depend on there's several entities in Washington State that are youth facilities that provide educational services as well as mental health services. If you get a records request from them saying Lisa's going to be here for a week or two, again it's your choice to either exit the student at that time as a confirmed transfer and re-enroll me when I return, or if you want to keep me enrolled not to disrupt my schedule or things like that, you would report me as primary no, excused absences because we know where the student is and at such time if the student's enrollment in that other school in the facility is done but they don't come back to you, you would backdate a transfer out of your school with a confirmed transfer. Thank you, Lisa. And this is also covered in the Cedars guidance. So we want to talk about, keep it, did we cover all the points on the other one? I'm sorry. Yep, I think, so. back, I think we did. Let's, we'll see back, here. let's go back and look. Um, whoops, one Ooh, more. Woo. we're jumping around. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So how and when to start contacting and tracking students who quit attending? Again, all of these things we think you should have district policy. Does it have to be written and, and notarized? Probably not. But you should have a meeting and have an understanding, whether it's in an email or writing something with your school registrars, counselors, Whoever's responsible for coding this data and say, you know, after the student's been gone for two or three days, let's start making phone calls or tracking or whatever your district or school policy is on that. You know, you make the phone calls to home, you send an email, you do whatever it is you need. Put in place, end of your coding or reporting of foreign exchange and home and private school students. You know, make sure your schools know at the end of every single school year to transfer those kids out. If the home and private school kids return the next school year, that's great, re-enroll them. But by transferring them out at the end of every year, you don't lose track of them and end up taking a dropout form. And those confirmed transfers out that are not included in your adjusted cohort graduation dropout data, which again, remember, are used for adequate yearly progress or AYP. And we talked about the district policy for verifying or confirming of leaving U.S. to return to country of origin. Again, in the guidance, under the confirmed transfer information, there's some verbiage in there about developing some policies in-house. And be creative in finding students. You know, we hear all over the place, folks use lots of tips and tricks for doing that, and this keeps popping up. Can we use Facebook to find a student? We want to be real careful with this. If you're on, and I know lots of districts are doing this, you could go look for the student on Facebook, and if you see a picture of Susan standing in front of a car with a big sign that says Battleground School District Homecoming or Battleground High School, please do not message the students. Um, 
what would be appropriate, because hey, even if the student linked back and said, yep, I'm in that grant, doesn't mean Susan's enrolled in attending. You can use that information to contact the Battleground School District and ask if she's enrolled. Another thing we hear folks doing if they say, we're moving to Portland, Oregon, and you never get a records request, call the Portland, Depart Portland Department of Education and ask them if they have Susan enrolled and can you send the records for her because you'd love to see Susan doing well. Those are different things. Yes, it takes time, but if you develop policies and start doing this on a continual basis, It'll kind of be the one-off information you're doing instead of struggling to clean up three and four years worth of data. Thanks. I think we can go and uh, just one follow-up question on the, the juvenile centers. Um, so if one of our students goes to Rimmon Hall, we withdraw them because Tacoma School District gets paid. Is that correct? Okay, so not being the fiscal agent here, Becky McLean, I'll throw a shout out to her, is our fiscal expert here at OSPI. I think what you're talking about is, can you claim them on count day? Again, that's a Becky question. You don't have to withdraw them, but again, we said you should report them as primary no if you choose to keep them enrolled. Lots of districts say we're not going to withdraw the student because they're out two days and they're back, and they're out three days and they're back, and they drop their schedule and it's a hassle. So you have a choice of either withdrawing the student at the time you determine they're enrolled somewhere else, and Raymond Hall has a juvenile justice school, so yes, you can withdraw them. If you choose not to, change them to primary no, and if the student's attending Raymond Hall Juvenile Justice School on account day, that's when the question would go to Becky, and it's who's providing the educational services on that day that gets to do the count. But again, that's a Becky McLean question. She has guidance and information on that. And Becky can be contacted at Becky, B-E-C-K-Y, dot M-C-L-E-A-N, at k12.law.us. And she's our, she's our expert there. OK, now we our next slide. So again, keep the list manageable. Track your students early and often. Have your district office review their dropout reports monthly. You know, once you get a hold of this, you go back and you look at this data. Um, you know, provide the list if you're Cedars person or somebody else tasked with this job, or even at the school level. I recognize every district operates differently. Some manage the Cedars data at the district level. Schools don't have access to the Cedars data. You've got it. Anyways, work out a system that someone's tasked with looking at the dropout reports, maybe dispensing them out to the schools, saying, hey, do you have any additional information? You know, policies and procedures in place to identify and reach out to ask at-risk students. We're hearing more and more districts are doing this. I think Red, so I think he was going to jump in and provide some information today about some of this, uh, about some of the top performers in here, you know, the kids that or A and B students and all of a sudden they have a bunch of absences and their grades are dropping. You know, work on that policy on contacting students after X number of days of absences. After two days, do you call them? Do you wait the 20? Again, you designate your staff and you utilize your unique tools. It's empowering your staff to understand how important their job is at the school level to track and report that information to you. And I can tell you Districts that have put these policies in place have really seen results. We have a follow-up on the juvenile um, detention center. If you are making the student primary no, do you also make them inactive, or would they stay active with primary no? I think that's probably an SIS question. So I'm not real sure how to answer that. If someone knows which SIS system Rosie works with, or she could tell us, we might be able to steer you to your vendor, because we don't know if the student's active or inactive unless they have absences. Of course, if you choose to keep the student enrolled in primary know while they are in a juvenile justice school or maybe in a mental health facility while receiving educational services, they would have excused absences if that's what you're speaking to, but something different, if you can email me separately 
and I can help you link up with the appropriate person to answer them. Um, is a verification of enrollment form acceptable when confirming their enrollment in another district? Uh, if it's a, for instance, if it's a signed choice form, or if you identify the student in Cedars as enrolled somewhere else, let's say we're trying to find Susan, gee, where's Susan, and we do a student search, and we see that Susan's been attending Bellingham School District for two weeks, you bet, that's confirmation of enrollment. You can print out that information, report her as a confirmed transfer, and update your records in your student information system and your CEDARS records. If you get a request for records through the Student Record Exchange or if Bellingham sends you a records request for, for Susan and you send all your records out, that's a confirmation of enrollment. If, it's, if you mean something different by verification of enrollment, go ahead and contact me later and we can chat about that. So here's a question about the juvenile court system has access to two statewide databases used to locate families to enter the BECA process. Is it possible to give someone at the district level access to these databases to locate students who have moved and we are unable to locate? Well. I don't have access to that database and I think that would be lovely. I don't know that the juvenile court system will give folks access to that because there's a lot of FERPA and HIPAA issues involved there. However, if the student is enrolled anywhere in Washington State, even if they dropped out in the 10-11 school year and now they've come back, maybe the re-engagement schools have picked them up, student search in CEDARS, for those of you with access to CEDARS, can tell you if the student's been enrolled anywhere, even for a very short period of time after they've left your district, or that P210 withdrawal report. Again, we talked about that report's available across years. If you go look at the 11-12 school year, or have your CEDARS person look at the 11-12 school year, and the student did not become re-engaged in school in Washington until this year, they'll still show up on that report. And I keep talking about your CEDARS person. If you're a superintendent or a principal or counselor today, there's an individual or individuals in your school districts tasked with the job of being what we call the CEDARS district admin. So the comprehensive education data and research system gets information submitted from all school districts and the entities that act as school districts, for instance, school for the deaf and school for the blind, educational service districts that host schools, they submit student level information to the CEDARS statewide database. That's a searchable statewide database. If you're not sure who that person is, bring them a cup of coffee, go hang out at their desk, do something, get to know them, and they can probably help you either develop those reports for you or possibly give you view access to those reports. Again, that's based on district policy, not because Lisa said to let me look at the reports. And I'll make a note here to, to follow up on the juvenile court system. Um, I don't, we'll, we'll see if that might be a possibility, but uh, that one's new to me, so I'll, I'll look, we'll follow up and we'll see if that might be an avenue for some people. That's a great one, yeah, and I'm, I'm kind of curious now because being a data person, it'd be nice to be able to look at that, but again, letting folks outside the court system have access to that, I can't answer, and I'll be curious to see what information you come up with, Susan. So we have a question on what resources are best for knowing research best practices for intervening with students who are at risk. Again, I wish Rhett was here with us today. We do have some information on the OSPI website um, for dropout intervention and programs, graduation and team effort. So on the screen right now, Susan just whipped over to the OSPI homepage. She did a search for GATE, G-A-T-E, which stands for Graduation and Team Effort. There's different, uh, what's working in dropout prevention, there's some webinars that have been recorded, some tips and tricks from what we might call the dropout early warning system, and I would also send an email to Rhett Nelson, uh, if you don't find what you're looking for here, again, it's R-H-E-T-T -T dot N-E-L-S-O-N at k12.wa.us, I know he's been reaching out 
um, to some of the districts that we've identified. I just don't know if they want me publicly throwing their names out here. Sure. But they're quite successful <laughs> thrilled. with what the school districts are. Oh, the oh, oh, the school oh, oh, oh. That have developed, and I know they're happy to share their information. Um, some of them have PowerPoints and whatnot um, about, you know, tips and tricks and what to look for. So I have put uh, Rhett's email out to everyone, and I'll also put the um, okay. The, oh, the gate website. Perfect. Yep, yep. So do we have any additional questions? I know we went through this rather quickly, but we wanted to leave time for folks to ask questions, ideas. I hope this was useful for you today. But we really wanted to bring Rhett and the staff he works with were extremely surprised when I presented them with the dropout data and they realized the number of unknown dropouts the unconfirmed transfers, and the kids that just disappeared during the school year. And they were also surprised when we talked with them qualitatively about some of the districts we've worked with, and it's made a huge difference. Five to 10% of their dropouts have been cleaned up or more, putting systems in place to track and follow up and just get the information from the desk of the people that are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis to the appropriate person in your district to get that cleaned up. So do we have any more questions? Anybody like to answer? Or feel free, we also, uh, the previous slide gave the opportunity if you have other suggestions that you could offer other districts on what's working well for you to identify these students, we'd, we'd love to hear from you as well. So we just had another question, how many years does CEDARS go back to and report? Well, that's a great question. Cedars um, first began in the 2009-10 school year. You can go back and clean up any of those data. Currently, through the 2015 school year for your five-year cohort data, that would have been 10-11 school year, we were looking at kids that may have dropped out in the 10-11 school year. We have another question that says, if we go back through our data example, 2013 school year can confirm transfer students well, if those students are identified as members of a graduation cohort, and in that 12-13 school year, that would affect your data this year, it could have a significant effect changing kids from unknown or dropouts, so what we call a negative status, to confirm transfer could really have a significant status on uh, or change to the cohort results for your district. So, so the... So we won't so it, go back and change the data reported like your 12-13 cohort results, but remember, if those kids were in grade 9 or grade 10, back there grade 11 when they leave, and they're, in, they're members of the cohort we're currently looking at, it's going to make a big difference. Can you appeal the data that we published for the 12-13 school year that might have included lease as a dropout? No, but you could potentially affect Fact, current data that's being reviewed. Okay, and that includes so. Perkins data, graduation dropout cohort data, and again, please remember, we have researchers that ask for this data back to the 9-10 school year constantly, including the Education Research Data Center, who works under the auspices of OFM, that uses that data for many, many, many purposes. Okay, so, so if I get you right there, the you know, you work within your cohort uh, time frame to keep that data, you can update that data, but once that graduation year has occurred for that cohort, the data, at that point, there is not the opportunity to adjust. Correct. Now, if they were members of the 14-15 cohort that we haven't published yet, we will publish the data, but if it affects your AYP results, you can file an appeal with us. If that's a question for you, please contact me separately after the meeting and we'll, we'll do a sidebar chat on this. So we had a great question. If we look up a student in EDS and verify they've enrolled somewhere else after leaving, can we print the screenshot as confirmation? Absolutely. So I think what you're talking about is either in CEDARS using uh, student search or potentially in the cohort application there's also a search student feature. If you identify the student enrolled somewhere else, could be in an institution, could be a re-engagement school, online school, could be in the brick and mortar school. If you identify them as being enrolled and reported by another school district after they've left you, you print that page out 
and keep it screenshotted, embedded in your SIS system, that is a confirmed transfer, and that's a great question. So, if we have any more questions, or are we done again? Do we have our contact information? Again, here's our contact information. And we did we did pass on one of the gravity questions. So at this point, oh, Will, exactly. if you have any um, other questions, otherwise I am going to loop back to that gravity question that was, um, do we make the student inactive in our entity while the student is attending gravity? And I wonder if it might be easier for this person to contact you directly, Lisa, since the guidance on that is... is that we have extensive guidance in that in our CEDARS guidance on how to report students, but truly if the student's attending a consortium re-engagement program, which gravity is considered a consortium program, so you're sending the student from your district, you, you have to report them to CEDARS with school and district enrollment, ethnicity and race, and you report where they're attending gravity through. Say, um, I don't know your school district, we'll just say Hope Graham School District, you have a re-engagement code, you would report all of that information to CEDARS primary note. We don't expect to schedule staff information, et cetera, because you don't have that. Gravity is reporting all of that additional information. And we have a question on where can we find the recording? It should be on page two of our PowerPoint. So if we can go back to page two of the PowerPoint, it'll show you. Red indicated it should be up within about a week. So it will be at the gate page, Susan was at, under slash results. And hopefully within about a week. And does jail count as a transfer? That's a great question. And I, Susan just closed this, I'm sorry. So does jail count as a transfer? If a student becomes incarcerated in what we would call an adult jail, but because of their age, their provided educational services, Yes, it's a confirmed transfer. If you ha if your district has students enrolled in these facilities and you're providing educational services, those students should be being should be reported to Cedars. For instance, if you live in the Seattle school district or you're from Seattle and there's a jail, maybe the county jail in Seattle, and you're providing educational services, Seattle should be reporting those students. If you find out the student was over in Spokane for the weekend and ended up in a jail in Spokane's providing educational services. Again, it has to be K-12 educational services. You could report that student as a confirmed transfer. If all you find out is Lisa's now in jail in Spokane and she's in an adult jail, that's not a confirmed transfer. All right. That's some great questions today, and I really appreciate everybody hanging in there. Again, feel free to email us. You know, I don't know if this was too light or went too deep. We really just wanted to draw your attention to the fact of the disparity or potential disparities between your student information system and what CEDARS knows about your kids, and maybe to provide some tips and tricks on how to get that data cleaned up and move forward and present a better picture for your district. Thank you, everybody. Susan, do you have anything else to add? Nope, I've just tried it. So, um, you know, as far as contact information, Lisa's the go-to person. Uh, any data quality issues, I'm happy to entertain uh, procedures for the dropout reporting. Lisa's the expert. So, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, feel free to email us, and we'll go ahead and. Uh, close the, the webinar if there's no more questions. And give us just a sec if you see it on here because we have to remember to put the recording and everything so we can post this online for you later. Thank you everybody. Have happy holidays.